Welcome to the Adventure Travel Show Podcast. I'm your host, Kit Parks, and today I'm super excited to bring on one of my dear friends and Wilderness First Aid EMT expert onto the program. If it weren't for our guest today, Casey, I probably would not be doing this podcast, period. He was instrumental in teaching me how to not only hike, but backpack, and got me down this train that I've been going on for the last decade. As much as we'd like to think that every time we go out into the woods or a desert or someplace away from civilization, everything's going to go just according to plan, sometimes that doesn't happen. So today we're going to be talking about wilderness first aid, things that we should be looking out for both before our our trip as well as during if something should happen. So without further ado, let's get started. I have got a very special guest today. His name is Casey, and I want to give you a little backstory on Casey. Maybe a decade ago, before the movies A Walk in the Wood and Wild came out, I had read a book on the history of the Appalachian Trail and got it in my head that I wanted to section hike this trail. Now, at the time, my only walking was around the block. I had no outdoor experience whatsoever, but I got in my head that I was going to do this. And so I said, well, there must be people that hike and all that. So I joined a meetup group and was lucky enough to get the man that we have on the program today as my leader that day. And when we were introducing ourselves, here I'm this 50-year-old woman who'd never been in the woods. And I told him I wanted to learn how to backpack and section hike. And he didn't laugh at me. Not only did he not laugh at me, I feel that Casey became, whether you even know this or not, Casey, a mentor to me. And you encouraged me. You took me under your wing. And if it weren't for you, Casey, this show probably wouldn't even be around today. So welcome to the show, Casey. I appreciate you coming on. Well, hello. And I can't believe that was a decade ago, and you're probably right. I know it was, because I was 50 years old, and I just turned 60 last month. Wow. It really is a decade. That's incredible. Yeah. Uh, no. And, and so in many ways, Casey, you changed my life. Well, you had the same effect on me, because I think when I was going through that time and doing a lot of the meetup stuff and organizing, I was kind of finding my self, I suppose. And I was finding myself in the outdoors. And for me, the biggest kind of payback or the best experience for me was when I was able to take people out and just kind of expose them to all the awesome things that are outdoors that really captivated me and had such a huge impact on my life. It was just one of those I love to share with other people. And it was just a perfect time in my life. And I felt like a mentor to Kit at the time because she was so excited. And I've met I don't know, hundreds, maybe a thousand people through my job in the outdoors. And you see very few people that are that excited. It's just like a look in their eyes where you're like, yep, they're serious. They're going to do that. And uh, Kit, you were definitely one of those. And, and, and I loved it. I still remember those hikes and it still just baffles me that that was a decade ago. It's crazy. <clears throat> but also, and the fact that you didn't laugh at me, which was, because oh. that would have been something that when you're already intimidated, you, I mean, my goal was ridiculous. And because you did not laugh, that was really, really cool. And I will be forever grateful because just discovering the wild has just opened my world in so many ways that unimaginable to me. However, oh, before we get into what the topic of today's show is, which is wilderness first aid, you had a complete transformation too. And I love the story. Would you mind telling us how you went from mortgage broker or banker to what you're doing today? Not at all. You know, I, I moved out here from Southern Illinois back in 2000, gosh, I think nine is when I left to Southern Illinois for Nashville. And I had been working in banking and mortgage. So I was a suit and tie guy, which is really hard to believe now when I tell people that they don't think I'm uh, telling them the truth, but it's true. And I had moved out to Nashville just to leave kind of my hometown where I'd been for 20 plus years. And I started a new job and I didn't really like it. It was in mortgage again, but it was all over the phone. And it's one of the only jobs in my life that one morning I just woke up and I called and I was like, I'm not coming in today or actually ever again. So I just, I just woke up one morning and quit. And then my brother had been out in North Carolina for a while. So he encouraged me to once again, move out to the Raleigh Durham area. And this time my U-Haul was pretty much all condensed and packed up. So shipped off to North Carolina, having no idea really what I was going to do. The original intent was my brother and I were going to start a business together. Um, We both have a business background. And and that time that I was moving, he and his wife had their first kid. So that really changed everything with insurance and children. So really, I was just kind of stuck here. I used to drink a lot. So when I moved out here, that was probably 
I would say maybe the apex of where I was at then. And I still couldn't tell you what happened, but one night I essentially drank too much and I had slipped in my kitchen or fell or passed out. I don't know, but I fell straight backwards and hit my head and got a super serious concussion that almost could have killed me. It was close. And when I came out of that, it was quite just a, an eye-opening experience to almost like see yourself lose your life. And I just decided that I wanted more than that. So I had gone to rehab for 30 days and came back from that just looking for something new. And for me, the outdoors was just a way that I could escape into something peaceful. And that's kind of how it started. And I would go out over and over and over again. And then I got into challenges of all sorts. And then one thing led to another. I started working at REI in 2012 as a part-time job for fun. And here I am still there today. And I've been in so many different capacities. But it just goes to show that anybody can do this. I came into the outdoors just like Kit. I had grown up spending some time in the outdoors, but not to the extent that I am now. And it's just once you discover that, it has a very powerful effect on who you are as a person. I I often joke and tell my students that I learned more in two years of spending time in the outdoors than I learned in all the education I had in my life. And you just learn that much about yourself. You learn who you are, what you're capable of, and how truly amazing you really are. Yeah, and so and so at REI, you then right now you're a trainer, you've become a wilderness first responder, you're a wilderness EMT, and that's the topic of today's show is, you know, not everything goes right when you're out in the wild and a lot of times things do go wrong so what we're going to talk about today is what are what are the things we need to be thinking about what are the things we need to bring what are some first aid hacks we can use because you can't bring everything you'd like to bring the city first aid is different than wilderness first aid so in fact why don't we just start by discussing that what makes it so different yeah so when you think of city first aid the response time from Emergency departments is extremely fast. I mean, fire departments, it's going to be less than five minutes in general, depending where you are in city centers. So your response time is quick. Essentially, you are going to be controlling whatever that situation is for minutes. And then somebody else with a lot of experience is going to take over and you're done. Versus the wilderness setting, at one point, Knowles was describing it as anywhere that is at least an hour away from definitive care. That may have changed a little bit over the years, but it just gives you that idea of now you're with somebody for an extended period of time. It could be an hour, it could be 12 hours, it could be days. So now you're kind of responsible for what happens right there, whether you want to be or not. So just being prepared in the wilderness is going to help those situations, should they arrive, go a lot better. And I couldn't stress enough how much it is important to do the pre- homework and give yourself like a little bit of a platform to work with. So when you run into these surprises, you have a little toolbox in your head. Okay. So I got two questions there. First of all, would you uh, define for us what Knowles is? And then two, yeah, so, yeah d- d- go a little bit deeper of what uh, what we should be thinking of. Tell us about the, the, the pre-planning. Sure. So Knowles is essentially kind of a standard. It is the National Outdoor Leadership School, and they do tons of trainings. And if there's anything that y'all take away from this programming to possibly look into is uh, Knowles, and there are other programs out there as well, offer wilderness first aid classes. And it's a, it's a weekend class, and you leave with a certification as with wilderness first aid. And the things that you learn in that class are amazing. I can get into those in a little more detail later. But that's kind of where Knowles comes from. They are educators. They have been. They're kind of the standard. And it's a fantastic program. So it's definitely worth looking into. And to touch on the pre-trip planning part, I feel like I, I really, truly do that trips are often made or broken before you ever leave the house. And it's the time you spend in learning about where you are going and what you may run into that allow you to prepare before you leave for those situations potentially. And the biggest part of that, everybody knows the answer to this question if I dig enough in classes, but it's how many people actually practice what they preach is let people know where you're going, somebody that is not with you and when you're going to be back. That whole, if something happens to you, you want somebody looking for you sooner than later. So I promise nobody will run into the woods and crash your party. So it's it's just super important to see what the weather is going to be so that you bring the appropriate clothing to see what the terrain is going to be like. All of those things, 
really doing detailed work on the trails you're going to be taking. So you're not going out there completely blind, which is when a lot of bad things tend to happen is when you get in over your head and get unprepared and things start to snowball before you realize it. And it just that, that brings to mind a couple of different things. Number one, when um, I was hiking in the White Mountains, when you get up to the top where you can actually drive up to, they have a list of all the people that died up there. Most of them are from exposure because they're in shorts when they head up the mountain because it's lovely down in the valley. But then they get up there and there could be a blizzard on top and or they get off trail and all these different things. Like you said, so it sounds to me like we have to prepare our emergency kit a little bit different depending on which trip we're taking. Absolutely. You know, I have core first aid kits that are going to have your general bandages and instruments and those things. And I, I actually have two different sizes for me, but it's not, it doesn't start just at the first aid kit. It's the other materials that bring that you're bringing with you that can even double as instruments for first aid. So something like a insulated jacket, you may or may not need it, but if you do need it, it's going to be one of those very important pieces. And just like you're talking about in the White Mountains, when exposure happens like that, it can happen super fast. And if you're caught off guard and you don't have additional tools to deal with it versus being uncomfortable, now you're going to become a victim, essentially. You're going to be the patient. Right. And I even remember the first time I hiked just a day hike on the Appalachian Trail, which, of course, I was probably wearing cotton clothing, a big no-no, because I, I, I knew nothing. I was completely clueless. and I, But I was even clueless that I was clueless. And it started raining and it was cold up there. And if it weren't for my friend Jerry having a heat blanket, I swear I was shivering. And that little packet the size of a deck of cards made all the difference in, I wasn't a danger situation, but it sure made a difference in the comfort situation. And were I in the back country, it would have been a very different situation. Absolutely. So, so let's, let's see from here. Let's talk about some of the different medical issues that can come up. And I also want to get from you, too, that I'll put uh, links in the show notes about what your basic kit is. And then I'll be taking notes as we go along. And I'm going to put all these into the show notes. So everybody be sure you get this. And if I see something that's not in my episode two on emergency kits, I will add whatever Casey's advice is to that. So we'll make sure we get all that for you guys as well. It seems to me, and and from what I, I've learned, that we can't just go out into the wild, whether it's the woods or the desert or whatever, and expect people to come help us if we get into trouble. It's your job as an explorer or whatever adventurer to self-rescue. And so can you talk a little bit about what that means? Yeah. I mean, for the self-rescue part, it's it comes down to a lot of that of being prepared and knowing what you're going into but not depending on other people to save you. And in a day like today of technology, it's very easy to get into the wilderness and still maybe have some kind of cell signal in different places where you feel like you still have that connection. I can dial 911. But to get out to the wilderness areas, what a lot of people don't realize is a lot of those rescue crews are, are volunteers. So for them to organize and get out somewhere, it can take hours. And depending on the terrain, it can take more hours for them to get to you. So basically, if you're by yourself, you're going to be taking care of you until somebody can get to you. And if you're with somebody else who's injured, that's where you become the caretaker and you're taking care of them until rescue can arrive. So a lot of that, and we'll get into that in maybe some more detail, is going to be some of that pre-training knowledge that you have. So when you're exposed to these situations where you're now scared you can rely on your knowledge to kind of help guide you. And a lot of that knowledge will just come out with practice. So let's say we come across somebody who's either bleeding or unconscious, and now we're an inadvertent first responder. What's the, what do we need to be thinking about? Sure. I mean, the first thing I'm going to think about if I see somebody unconscious is, you know, <laughs> making sure that they are still breathing and trying to kind of figure out what happened if I can get them to respond. And, you know, bleeding similarly, depending on the bleeds, I have a really interesting story on bleeding that is probably one of the nastiest incidents that I've ran into. And I can tell you about that if you would like. I do. I love a good story. So I think this may have been 2015, 2016, since the years are ticking by so fast now. But I was hiking with my best friend to a waterfall and it was, I was leading a meetup hike actually. And we were in the back and my wife and the rest of the group was in front and uh, it was raining and uh, my buddy really loves his machete. He brings that thing everywhere and he had just sharpened it like 
I mean, shiny steel sharpened down. So it was super sharp. And he was kind of cutting brush away from the trail as we were going along. And if you haven't looked at a lot of machetes, they have a little string that can go around your wrist. That's a terrible idea, by the way. You should never attach a machete to your arm. He did not. He knew better. But what happened was the machete slipped out of his hand. It went about, I don't know, five or six feet into the woods, and it hit a little tree sapling, which somersaulted it back and right across his calf, and it filleted his calf open. Ooh. And I didn't see it happen, but I saw him kind of go down to the ground, and I turned around and asked if he was okay, and his girlfriend at the time looked like she was freaking out, and he told me no. And this is one of those guys, he taught me a lot of what I know, and he's tough. Uh, and I never heard him say he wasn't okay before. And then when I looked down... I saw just an open calf. It was really nasty and then started bleeding really bad. And what's interesting where I talked about, you know, even having a little bit of training and how it kicks in is what happened after that, I don't really remember. I remember kind of going into it, his girlfriend later described, but I essentially dropped down, ripped my stuff out of my backpack before I could think about it and was putting pressure on that and basically building a pressure dressing right then and there without really thinking about it. And a lot of that was just a little bit of training that I've had at that time really kicked in and it just takes over for you. And you just know kind of, I've got to do this. I'm not even a huge fan of blood if it's my own and I generally puke. So it's just very interesting to me, somebody else describing looking from the outside in responding to that kind of incident that I think he ended up with something like 30 stitches and 14 staples in his calf. So it was a pretty nasty one. All, all ended out okay, but it was, it was a scary one. I'll bet. Do you remember when you took us, we were out in the Brevard area, and we went down to see the waterfall in that little pool, and Becky almost got impaled by that huge branch or tree. Do you remember that? I do remember that. That was, that was my first wake-up call. So just a little backstory. So the same meetup group has an annual big camping trip, and Casey had taken us on this one. It was like, a, I'm going to guess, like a half a mile straight down to this beautiful, deep, black pool that had a waterfall going into it. And there was a little ledge under the, by the waterfall that one of the other ladies, Becky, had swum over to. She's just sitting, dangling her feet over the ledge, and then she decides to swim back to the little beach area. And like I said, I don't know if it was a tree or a massive branch just missed impaling her. And that pool was so deep and so black. I don't know, A, could we have found her? And B, how the heck would we have gotten her up out of that little teeny thing? I don't even think a helicopter could have gotten down there. No, that's a that's a perfect example. I forgot about that story until you started talking about it. But yeah, there was a cliff above it that was probably 35, 40 feet high. And a, a tree that was up there, basically the roots just gave out while she was swimming. And that tree fell exactly where she had been just seconds before. Seconds, yeah, seconds. And the mister by a couple of feet. I mean, I still shake a little bit when I talk about it. I was like, what the heck would we have done? Ah, man. It's a good thing we don't we don't have to know what we were I know, about. I know, but but that just yeah. goes to show you, just like with your friend with the machete, you don't expect these things to happen. You know, it could be a rock fall, it could be who knows what. And then all of a sudden you've got to fix it. So wait, let's go through some of the things that can happen. All of a sudden you're cut or you're bleeding. What are we supposed to be thinking about? What are we supposed to do? Sure. So, I mean, anytime you have blood, you know, whether it's your own, especially if it's somewhere else, part of your first aid kit is you definitely want gloves. So your PPE, personal protective equipment. But the first thing you want to do with bleeding is stop bleeding. Depending on the severity of the bleed, you want to try to get it above the heart if you can, if it's on a limb, just to slow some of that bleeding a little bit. But the idea is get that bleeding to stop. So if you need to add a pressure dressing, which isn't anything fancy by pressure dressing. I mean, I put some gauze on it and then use an ACE bandage to basically hold that together so the bleeding can kind of stop. So anytime you see a bleed, first thing in your mind is stop bleed. How severe is the bleed? Is this something like a leg where you're looking maybe for an arterial bleed? But for the most part, you're not going to run into big things like that on hiking trips. It's possible, but usually it's going to be the smaller bleeds. You cut yourself with a knife at camp, you've slipped and fall and something like that, sharp rocks. So stop bleeding fast. That's that's the big part of that. And how important is it to clean the wound or to be clean and avoid infection? Or do we is stopping the bleeding more important than preventing infection if, if there's a lot of blood or tell, talk about that? Yeah, that, I mean that's that's a great question. And The idea is you definitely want to clean those wounds out. However, depending on the severity of that bleed, you're going to want to get that bleeding to stop first. Because as long as that blood is 
going out, it's going to be difficult to impossible to really get in there and clean that wound. So it's really getting that blood to start to clot and that wound to stop bleeding so that you can get in there and you can clean it. Because that can be very important, especially if you're only out for a day, maybe that's not a big deal because you're going to get back to definitive care if it's serious. But if you're in the middle of a backpacking trip and you're, you know, 10, 20 miles away from somewhere, that can become a bigger issue pretty quick depending on how nasty that wound is because they can get super infected. And of course, if it's an animal bite, animal bite of any type, um, that's going to end your trip pretty much immediately because those get infected super fast. Mm, that's good to know. And I did read that if it's going to get infected, it usually happens in the first 24 to 48 hours. That's right, because that's when that stuff is creeping down. And once that infection sets in, it's there. There's nothing you can do about it to manage it now. Somebody else is going to have to do something essentially at that point. So how do we decide we get cut? How do we decide it's time to get back to civilization or this should be okay for the weekend or, or whatever it is? What's our mental protocol? Yeah, so a lot of that can even come down to the individual. And a lot of what I talk about in injuries in the outdoors is most people are out there because they want to be out there. They're not out there by force. So they're out there by choice. And it's going to depend on what your tolerance is, but I call it the fun factor. So when the fun factor goes away and things are no longer fun, generally that's a good indication that maybe you should just end the trip, cut your losses where it is. Because if you keep moving on and something just hurts, it takes away from the whole trip in general. So a lot of it you can assert to, am I still having fun? Am I still going to have fun? for the less serious things. And that'll generally answer those questions. When something is really badly cut, the last thing I really want to do is just keep hiking, sweating and getting dirt into it. And it sounds like too, you, you, there's some people that are like, I started this, I'm going to finish this, that sometimes you need to, to put that, I don't know if it's ego or personality trait. Sometimes you just have to call the hike. Or call that's right and you got to remember that uh wilderness doesn't care about your ego um, right they're the only one that has your ego and the egos are usually those things that get you in a lot of trouble in the wilderness right so let's all right so now we've made camp we're cooking and oops we burnt ourselves what do we do so that is my absolute one of my absolute least favorite injuries to have to deal with burns are nasty so when you're cooking be super careful with boiling water jet boils don't use those on top of picnic tables. Put those on the ground so that somebody else doesn't accidentally knock that over when their butt hits the picnic table and spills that whole boiling water in your lap. And that's generally where most burns, the serious ones happens is with, with boiling water. You can also have stuff with fire. But burns, they usually end the fun factor pretty quick because small burns can be extremely painful just on fingers. So Generally, a rule of thumb, if it's a small burn that blisters a little bit, it's going to come down to that tolerance. But if it's a large burn that covers a decent sized area, that's going to be a trip ender for sure. So we do burn ourselves. What are we supposed to do? So with burns, they're pretty nasty. A lot of depending on the if it's a first degree, second degree, third degree burns as those go cooling it down. So if you've got a cool, clean water, and this is where you've kind of got to use your head when you're outdoors, don't immediately go stick your hand necessarily in a stream of moving water where there's bacteria that might get into stuff. So if you've got clean water and an algae bottle or something, just being able to cool that down. I always carry some kind of burn gel in my first aid kit. A lot of them will come with that already. That's just kind of ease that burning feeling and then keep that protected, but don't necessarily seal that burn up, but definitely keeping it protected. Okay, good. So we talked about wounds. We talked about burns. Let's talk about soft tissue injuries. All of a sudden, oh, I've twisted my ankle. I've twisted my knee. Now what do we think about? Now there is your most common injury that you're more likely to see anywhere is going to be the twisted ankles, potentially broken ankles, but most of it is, is twisted knees, ankles. So <clears throat> this comes down to a couple things, depending on how much that hurts. Sometimes the first is to assess what happened and how much that that is really giving somebody pain, but how usable is it? That's the first, one of the first things that your investigation to, to figure out is going to be. Can they stand on it? Can they put some weight on it? Can they put half their weight on it? If they have a trekking pole, can they move using something assisted? So assessing that accessibility is a big one. And then if it is something where they can't walk on it or it's not manageable at the time, that's where your first aid kit can help having ace bandage wraps. You can build splints out of a lot of materials that are in your backpack. If you think about it ahead of time, a lot of sit pads, parts of trekking poles, you can use jackets, all sorts of things to build kind of your own 
splint essentially. Yeah. And, and like I mentioned, like the null stuff earlier in wilderness first aid, that weekend class, that's what you learn a lot of stuff. You're going to bring all the stuff you would normally hike with. And a lot of that is using what is in your pack to fix whatever is going on at that time. So it gets really fun. It's a creative side to uh, emergency management. Well, so what are some of the, the creative things that you learn to use to make a splint? Sure, man. I do so many different things with, with the different trainings and recertifications. I mean, we have used literally wood sticks if somebody had a compound fracture in a leg, basically, to keep that leg sturdy and straight and basically wrap it up with jackets and then cover that with your elastic bandage. Um, and that does a really good job of stabilizing a leg. Um, sometimes that's the best that you can do in the woods. Duct tape is a huge, big, big one of mine, probably one of the most important of my first aid items, just because it can do so many things. You can duct tape wounds closed. You can uh, use that for securing those items in place. So those are some of my favorites. And it's, it's really simple, tiny things like that. A lot of it comes down to some of that extra clothing. And if you are, I guess, pro tip, if somebody else is injured, Use the stuff out of their pack before you use the stuff out of your own pack, because generally if they get carted away somewhere, you'll never see your stuff again. So that's, that's a good pro tip is try to use their stuff on them before you use your own stuff. I, I like that idea. And all, I read something too in my research for this interview is when you're assessing and, and making notes, particularly if you think they're going to need outside help, write their vitals that you can or write the information on duct tape and then tape it to their legs so that that goes with them. Absolutely. So, and, and as far as duct tape too, I like to wrap it around my hiking pole. So that way it's always easily accessible. That's one of the best places. I wrap it around there. I have it wrapped around a pencil in my first aid kit and I might have some wrapped around an algae. And so it's, it's, it's super useful. Not just for emergency, you get a hole in a tent, something. Right. It, it's duct tape. You can build planes out of it. I, I've actually used it to treat a blister, which was my next question. What do we do with blisters? Some people say pop them. Some people don't. What's what's the protocol oh, on that? Oh, yes. And blisters. Here's the best thing about blisters is they are super avoidable. And a lot of that is just kind of knowing about blisters so that you don't get blisters. And one of the big things and the kickers that get a lot of people is make sure you uh, break in your hiking boots and don't go out on a first trip with brand new shoes because you will get blisters and they will be painful. But that aside, blisters always start out as just an uncomfortable feeling and you know it's there, but people for some reason just ignore it. You know, if anybody wants to try a little example of something right now, take your hands together and rub them as hard as you can and you'll see how much they heat up and eventually they heat up enough that you stop. But for some reason with our feet and shoes, we just keep going when we feel that uncomfortable pressure because it's just a little bit hot. And that pressure and what you're feeling right there is when you can stop a blister because essentially you are getting a blister. That skin is rubbing uncomfortably. That's what you're feeling. Doesn't hurt yet. That's the time to stop. Take your shoes off and put some moleskin on that. If you didn't have moleskin and you have duct tape, something to cover that up. That's the prevention side of things. But most people just ignore that until it becomes painful. And once it's become painful and you pop your shoe off, lo and behold, you have that big nasty blister. And now you're treating a blister. Your avoidance is gone. You got that blister. It's with you for the rest of the trip. So the whole point of, you know, the first part of that is, is recognizing and doing something about it. If you need to stop, stop. Don't worry about being that person in the group. If that's the case, that stops them down. Everybody's willing to wait on you. Nobody's going to chastise you. <laughs> we're talking less than five minutes to pre-treat a blister while it's still a hot spot. Absolutely. And, and don't wear cotton. I mean, there's a lot of little things that go into that, but definitely cotton socks and letting your feet be able to breathe throughout the day and not maybe having your boots on for 12 hours. But when you stop and take a lunch break, letting your feet dry out, maybe putting your socks on a rock or swapping socks out. That's why two pair of socks is perfect because you can Swap the dry pair out, throw the other nasty ones in your backpack and so they can smell up the forest and then dry out and you can swap them back and forth. My wife is the worst about this and she's gotten blisters the size of quarters and half dollars before. And I lecture her every time, you know, I could have done something about that if you just would have told me, but she never tells me until it's huge and it's got that big bubble on it. So try not to get blisters, but if you do get the blisters... Some of the things you can do is, and you'll learn this in some wilderness first aid classes, or you can even buy books, look online. You can self-educate yourself quite a bit. 
But using mole skin to maybe build around the blister, how big is it? Because essentially you don't want something rubbing on top of that blister. So a lot of it's cutting holes out and building up around that blister so you can protect it. And then it keeps changing. I've heard a lot of things on popping blisters or leaving them the same. You're going to be kind of treating that blister if you pop it a little bit like an open wound. So you just want to make sure that you do keep that clean if that blister does pop. Blisters will eventually pop on their own as well. So sometimes I will leave that little bubble there and build around it, but eventually it's going to bust. Or if you bust it, it's not the end of the world. Just make sure you treat it and don't let that get infected. So another thing I like too about blister prevention that works for me is wearing a liner sock. And now I'm really into these toe socks because I get blisters between my baby toe and the second toe. And so I love those. Yes. And you know, when you're thinking about friction and when you're rubbing your hands together, now if you stick a glove on one of your hands and you rub it against that other hand, it doesn't get as hot as fast. And essentially that's kind of what you're doing by using a sock liner is you're adding another piece in there that's taking some of that friction before it gets to skin level. So if you have a lot of problems with blisters, liner socks do work really well. And, you know, I'd never thought of the toe socks for the blisters between the toes because I'd never experienced that. But that's, that's oh, they work great. I think that works fantastic. That's a, that's a good one. They work great. I've got some wool ones that I haven't had a problem since I started wearing them. Love them. Love them. And so the next problem I want to talk about is dehydration. And this actually, remember, you were telling me you have to pee every hour, which seemed a little excessive to me. But so... What are the, what's the deal on dehydration and, and tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so that is definitely another one of those that you're likely to run into. And most of you have probably already run into it yourself, whether you really realized it or not, because there's different stages of dehydration. And this is probably the biggest one that is really easy to get taken off guard by. Because when you're working really hard for long periods of time, generally rigorous activity up to a liter of water an hour. So when you're thinking about backpacking and hiking up mountains, that's pretty rigorous activity and you're sweating pretty hard. So being able to replace that water is going to keep you going longer and just feeling better and keep you from getting dehydrated. That's another one I've run into various stages of quite a bit in my career in the outdoors. Probably one of the most common ones out there. Looking at your pee, that's really going to kind of tell you how well you're doing and trying to pay attention to it, you know. If it's clear, that's a pretty good thing. You're drinking a lot of water, but if it's super dark and brown and almost thick, and that's that's generally a really bad sign that you need to be drinking a lot of water. Because the problem with dehydration is one of those big preventatives. As long as you drink enough water, you keep yourself from dehydrated, but it's also one of those, once you become dehydrated, it's not a matter of just drinking a glass of water and you bounce back all of a sudden. It's going to take your body a little while to recover. So you may have that headache, you might be irritable, you might be tired. So think of those things and drinking water so you don't have to go into that state and you'll continue enjoying your trip a lot better. But you know, there's another thing that goes along with hydration that I learned the hard way. I think I was backpacking in July in Gorgeous State Park, probably 100 degrees outside. And I remember that day I had drank at least 11 liters of water because it was just that hot, sweating that much. So in my mind, I'm like, hey, I'm doing great. I'm still peeing every hour. I'm drinking enough water. I'm sweating like crazy. But when you are drinking that much water and sweating that much, You got to think about your electrolyte balance. And when essentially you're drinking that much water and peeing that much, you're peeing out all your electrolytes. So what happens is muscle cramps and they can be quite severe. And in this particular trip, I had never experienced muscle cramps to this extent before. I'd had some mild ones, but both of my quads turned to concrete. That's how hard your muscles get. And it's excruciatingly painful. It pretty much took me out to my butt on the trail. And if somebody was trying to roll my thighs out with trekking poles, I put new tablets in my mouth and started chewing them. So I looked rabid, foaming at the mouth. And it hurt more than when I broke my leg. So muscle cramps are bad. So hydrate, but also replace those electrolytes. Everybody's heard of Gatorade. You can get little tablets that dissolve in your water bottle that essentially have electrolytes in them. And you can get them caffeinated, non-caffeinated, different flavors. But those are a great thing to bring so that when you're drinking that water, you can toss one of those tablets in there and place those electrolytes and never get into the muscle cramp land. 
I guess it goes with what Becky, who I had on the last episode about talking about altitude training, because you need to make sure you're well hydrated there too. And she was recommending alternating between water and some type of electrolyte drink for that very reason. Yeah, exactly. And I've never had that happen again. I got close once where I could feel those muscle cramps coming on. And this time, instead of just pushing through with that whole ego I talked about earlier, I stopped and I drank a lot of electrolytes and spent about 30 minutes before I started that activity again, because I didn't want to go back to where I was. And since then, I drink electrolytes every time I go out when I'm sweating a lot and I've never had a muscle cramp problem. So trust me, you do not want them. They are terrible and they are very, very avoidable. Right. And if it's windy or very dry, too, you may not even realize how much you're sweating. Yeah. And even in the wintertime, a lot of people don't feel their body sweating, but just the exhale from your uh, mouth, your, your water vapor is constantly coming out and basically evaporating. So even if you're not sweating, you still have water vapor coming out of your mouth and you can still get dehydrated. One of the things that kind of seems to go hand in hand with the dehydration is a heat exhaustion and its counterpart hyperthermia. Let's talk a little bit about those two. Sure. So heat exhaustion, that is, that's, that's starting to get really serious. If that's not treated pretty quickly, that can lead to heat stroke, which can kill you. So this is where dehydration basically takes a turn for the worst. And I have been, again, on a meetup with an individual, again, in July, it was a long hike, and he had some very, very bad heat exhaustion. And it's one of those, he didn't really tell me until it got far enough along that he knew he couldn't control it. And uh, I thought I was going to have to spend the night in the woods with him uh, because he would go about five feet and then have to sit down for five minutes and then move five feet and sit down for five minutes. So what starts happening with heat exhaustion, essentially your heart rate and your respiratory rate is going to speed up. You're going to feel really dizzy, kind of fainty. Your skin turns to kind of that pale, cool and clammy look. It might be really red and flushed. And this is where that fatigue, thirst, and muscle cramps comes in. So when I was muscle cramped, had I kept going and going and going, I would have been on the verge of heat exhaustion. So I was pretty close. And what you basically do with heat exhaustion is you put somebody in a cool, shady spot, and you hydrate them, and you rest them, and you hydrate them, and you rest them. Um, If they need to eat, that's another one of those important things. Have them eat. So When you get dehydrated or if it gets below that and you're just super dizzy, that's when you need to sit somebody down and um, just watch them have them drink water. And you can still turn that around with heat exhaustion at that point. But if you continue down that road, it can turn into heat stroke, which essentially your body can no longer manage the heat and you stop sweating altogether. And that's the big sign of heat stroke. When you stop sweating, that is terrible, terrible, bad, bad news. And that's one of those you've got to get somebody evacuated once you get into that heat stroke range. So don't ever get there. That's the point is kind of knowing um, that self-education ahead of time. Hey, I need to bring water and some electrolyte tablets and I need to drink them regularly and you will avoid these issues. And if I'm not mistaken too, because I think I once actually moving recently got to that point where I think you get a little mental confusion too. So you may not be making the best, best decisions. Yeah. And this is where a lot of that snowballing starts to take effect because a lot of injuries in the outdoors aren't a cause and effect by usually one thing. A lot of the really bad injuries and the bad situations can be traced down to a series of bad decisions or a series of events. So when you think of dehydration, your mind is also slowing down. Your decision-making ability is not clear anymore. So then you're in that zone of making bad decisions, which can lead to worse injuries and then worse bad decisions. And the snowball effect just keeps going and going and going. But I think I've read that too on, on it. Um, we're talking about the counterpart, the hyperthermia, that a lot of times they end up, if they're up in the mountain, they take their clothes off, even though they're freezing to death. Yeah. You know, that's one of those like very end stages of hypothermia. And that's just, it's crazy, crazy, but um, it's very true. And uh, hypothermia, <laughs> I've had experience with this one in the outdoors as well. <sighs> hypothermia, that's, that's a big one because it can get you fast. You know, when you're thinking of summertime, and this is what I think in my head when I go to some of the places that I go, if I broke my leg and it wasn't a severe break, it was just a clean break, and the summertime, I'd be okay waiting for rescue to come for quite a while. But if I have that same injury in the wintertime, I can no longer move, which means my body's heater gets turned off. And hypothermia can set in super, super, super fast. So 
one of the things with winter camping is I don't recommend learning in the winter time. I recommend learning and then graduating into winter time camping because everything is more serious when cold weather is involved when it comes to injuries, especially the uh, skeletal injuries like that. So clothing comes into a lot of this, that pre-preparing, having that extra jacket, whether you think you're going to need it or not, if it's a puppy jacket, having that other layer. And then, of course, having that one piece of clothing that you should never, ever, ever leave home without, whether it's a day hike or a backpacking trip or whatever it is, and that's your rain jacket that is waterproof and windproof. That can also add another layer. So having those items ahead of time is where you can put those on and stop stop hypothermia from getting worse. The worst that I have seen was on a, a waterfall trip with some friends of mine in the winter time. It was January and there's about a foot of snow on the ground and we repelled a 140 foot waterfall with ice on it and all sorts of things. And some people we were with were a little less experienced and we ran into a situation where the leader was having to lower people. So he was sitting in water that was ice cold for four to five hours. And I knew his situation was getting bad and I was down below and there was no way I could get to him or do anything about it. So it was a really scary situation. And when he finally did get down after dark in a headlamp in January, he was in stage two hypothermia. It was the same guy that hurt himself with a machete. And then he told me this time too, uh, he was not doing that great. And it took us a while to warm him up. We were there for a good three hours around a fire before we started hiking out. So that can get really scary and go downhill fast. And once you get into stage three hypothermia, that's where you're going to need some kind of other intervention that you're not going to be able to do in, outside in the wilderness, essentially, when you get into you know what you're talking about with taking clothes off in severe hypothermia cases. So if we come across somebody that's got, do we use our own body heat? We just put our, as many clothes, let's say we, we should always be able to build a fire, but let's say for some reason we can't. What are some of our stopgap things or what, what are the things that we could do to help this person or ourselves? You, Sure. You can use body heat as long as it's not somewhere it's cold where it's going to uh, take you into being a patient as well. But some of the things that you'll have in your first aid kit that I always carry is one of those emergency blankets, which essentially reflects body heat. So in that situation, you could use your body heat and use that blanket to reflect heat back on them. In wilderness First responder, which is a higher uh, level of training above that wilderness first aid, you learn how to build hypo hypothermia wraps, essentially using a sleeping bag and using plastic to basically create a nice warm place for somebody. So just warming them up the best way that you can possibly, because you got to keep in mind when somebody gets really, really, really cold like that, their body temperature has dropped enough that even putting them in a sleeping bag, it's going to take a little more to warm them up because their body is just not producing the heat to make that whole system work. All right. Well, that's uh, kind of intimidating. So another problem that we might run into is somebody that goes into shock. What is that? And what are, what are, what are the signs of it? What kind of treatments can we do? And tell us a little bit about shock. Shock is scary. Hopefully none of you experience shock but shock isn't what i used to think when uh, i would watch jaws as a kid and they say somebody went into shock and i thought shock was like you got scared so bad that you started panicking and that's what shock was but that's not that's not what shock is basically shock is your body has been compensating for some kind of injury or illness and it gets to the point where your body can no longer compensate and that's when you start to enter shock and shock is very dangerous because if it's not treated, that will potentially lead to death pretty quickly. There's a lot of different things that can be monitored for shock, but generally people might become anxious, they're restless, they're confused, their heart rate is going really fast, they're breathing really fast. It has a lot of the similar symptoms to dehydration or even hypothermia. So if you suspect shock at all, it's a rapid evac. It's, it's getting that person out as quick as you can. And what are, what are some of the triggers that could cause shock if we're out, out in the wild somewhere? I mean, there can be lots of issues that can cause shock, loss of blood that can cause shock. If you are, you know, di dehydrated and hypothermic, as we talked going down those stages, that can also get you into shock. So it's essentially 
your body can no longer fight or keep up with whatever has happened to you. And, and that's what shock is. It is basically your body can no longer keep up. So then the, what usually happens after shock is your heart rate goes way up, your, your respiratory rate goes way up. And eventually those things drop and they drop big time. And, and that's when things get really scary because that is your body basically saying, I can no longer do what I am doing. I'm out of energy. I'm out of everything. And that's kind of, that's what's scary about shock. Gotcha. Another thing that, in fact, uh, I'm going to put a whole bunch of links. So make sure you go to the show notes on this because I've covered a lot of things like the next one about lightning. Let's say somebody gets hit by lightning. What do we do? Wow. Lightning is another one of those scary ones, but it's also one of those very, very, very common injuries that you're going to see in the outdoors. Everybody's always scared about black bears and rattlesnakes and all the things that seem scary, but lightning will kill more people than all those other things combined. So it kind of puts a reality uh, check on those. But lightning... Once somebody is really struck by lightning, the first thing you want to make sure of before you jump into your rescue mode is, is it still storming? Is there still lightning? Because you need to take care of you first so that you can take care of other people. Because if you throw yourself right into a bad situation, you could potentially just become another victim. So making sure you're in a safe situation and that you're in a safe place that you can respond. You'll learn if you get further into some of those wilderness first aid classes, the first thing you should think of is I'm number one, which means take care of yourself first. So then you can take care of other people's, but you should always put yourself first. Gotcha. And, but let's say, okay, they've been hit for whatever reason. We now feel like we're safe. It's okay to touch them. It's do we do CPR? What, what, what do we do? Do we cover them? What do we, uh, what do we do? Yeah. Lightning, you know, <laughs> I've seen pictures and there's different types of lightning and it can do different. Some people can get struck by lightning um, and they may get outer burns and they might not feel anything. Other people, obviously it can stop your heart. It's a big jolt of electricity. So the first thing you're going to look for in a lightning strike situation is you're going to check for heart rate and you're going to check for breathing. And essentially those things are easy. If you talk to somebody and they respond to you, they're breathing. That's a good sign. But if they're unconscious, looking for the rise and fall of the chest, checking for uh, a pulse, essentially. And if, if they have no pulse, you've got to start CPR. That's the best that you can do. And I've heard they've changed CPR, if I'm not mistaken, that they're, they've, because I took CPR class like 40 years ago, and we did the mouth and then the, the chest pulses and all that. But now they're saying just do the chest pulse. Is that the, the new protocol? Yes, yeah, so the, the compressions are what they've gone to to, to start first, because it. It is more, if you think about the body system, air goes in and out, blood goes round and round. So in that situation for the heart is those compressions are keeping that blood and that heart moving to try to keep that blood going round and round. Because if the heart stops, the breathing is going to stop with it, essentially. So compressions become that first part instead of doing the... And that's something we should also, let's say we think somebody's had a heart attack or something like that. So it's, it's not an injury all of a sudden, and people have had heart attacks on trails and how do we tell that talk about that oh so heart attacks are like one of my scariest things and again i i've had that almost happen to me on a hike where a friend of mine we were on another winter trip up to sassafras mountain in south carolina and it was a tough hike we got to the top we hung out next day i'm at work and somebody calls me um at 10:30 a.m. and tells me that my friend that we were just with had a massive heart attack and i later found out that he had told another friend we were hiking with he was having symptoms but he didn't tell me who he knew i had the medical training but he had an almost complete blockage so if he would have had the that heart attack 12 hours earlier he would have been dead because chest compressions are to make that blood go round and round. If you have a complete heart attack and a complete blockage, there's no way to get that blood going round and round. So heart attacks are one of those that'll sneak up on you. Hopefully you don't have to experience them. But in those situations, if somebody does have a heart attack and they stop breathing and they lose a pulse, the best you can do is, is CPR. And hopefully you can get somebody to you fast. And with heart attacks, it's it's the symptoms leading up to a heart attack that can let you know that that's coming. It's not always the case. They can be very sudden, um, but there are symptoms with heart attacks that you can pay attention to that maybe give you a warning. 
And it sounds too like, particularly if you're hiking with a partner, which I always recommend that you do, is communicate and, and talk. And, and that was one thing Becky had recommended too. Just check in every once in a while. How do you feel? You know, just assess each other because particularly if something is going wrong, that person may not be cognitively aware that they are impaired. Exactly. And that's very common because they might just be irritable, but they don't, they don't even know why. We've all been hangry. So it's very similar to that. You don't even necessarily know you're hangry. You just know everything is making you mad and you're irritated. Gotcha. So what are the things that you do not go anywhere without putting in your day pack or your backpack? Let's talk a little bit about your, your favorites, particularly if there's something that's not intuitive. Sure. I mean, the obvious for me is a headlamp, just because I've been in places where I forgot a headlamp, and that's, that's a bad one. But as far as like medically things, I never go anywhere without, believe it or not, one of my favorite items is at least one of my trekking poles. If I'm backpacking, I generally have two, but always I have that one trekking pole just because A, it can help me from getting injured just with balance, but B, it has a lot of other uses as well. Like we talked about earlier, if you need to splint a fracture, things like that. Another thing I never, ever, ever leave home without is a really simple, simple, simple thing. Diphenhydramine, which is just the fancy name for Benadryl. Because my other big fear is allergic reactions in the wilderness because those can be super severe. And that's another one of those big fears because there's not a whole lot you can do to stop an allergic reaction if it gets serious and you don't have the tools to do it. So Benadryl, whether it's you or I always think of, I might run into somebody else in those situations. So I just want to make sure I, I have some of those tools. And that, that's one of those that hopefully that does the trick. And I ask people in every single trip and every class I teach, if I'm going to be in the, in the outdoors with them, who here has been stung by a bee? I look for the raise of hands. Did anybody have a severe allergic reaction? Does anybody have an allergy to bees? I mean, if it's all no's, then I look for the people who didn't raise their hands and they're always there, sometimes more than you would think that have never been stung by a bee in their life. Those are the ones that scare me because I have no idea and they have no idea how they're going to react if they do get stung. So those who know me laugh about it. I have lots of bad encounters with yellow jackets doing what I do all the time. So that's my big fear in the woods are, are hornets. They are, uh, they're mean. Yes, hornets are mean. And, and also your, your, your allergy levels can change that you can suddenly develop allergies you didn't know you had. Which yeah, is absolutely. My family. Absolutely. So one good tip too, while I'm thinking about too, I interviewed Dr. Siegel about sprained ankles and he recommends always keeping a compression sock in your backpack, day pack or whatever, because if you do twist your ankle, you can keep that swelling down. It's going to be a lot easier for you to get back to your base camp or civilization, whatever the case may be. Exactly. And that's good advice. And it's little things like that, but I guess the obvious that I never actually leave without is my first aid kit. I mean, I don't want to diminish that because there are plenty of people out there that just don't bring a first aid kit or they rely on somebody else's first aid kit. And so, you know, super important. It's one of those things. If you never have to use it in the 20 years that you're hiking, awesome. But you should bring it all 20 years because when you need it, you're going to need it. And it's just one of those items. It's in the 10 essentials. Never, ever, ever leave your first aid kit at home. Um, a- it's that important. Anything that I should have asked you about wilderness first aid that I neglected to do or any final thoughts that we should know going forward? Touched on so many of the good topics because I didn't have my little knolls fold out here and you hit, you hit a lot of those big topics. Oh, I know I, one we didn't talk about. Spinal okay. injury. Oh, yes. Somebody falls. How do we, do we move them? What do we do? Yeah. Spinal injuries, they're scary. And when you, when you're responding, and even if you take that wilderness first aid class, you're going to learn a lot about what's called the patient assessment system or the patient assessment triangle, which is essentially what you do if you run across something like this. And spinal injuries is always one of those first things we're looking for. And a lot of times you will see the first thing you do, if it's any type of Spinal injury is suspected. You hold that person's head so they can't move it and you don't let go of that head until either somebody with more training has arrived because you don't want uh, to exacerbate a spinal injury. So they're scary. 
hopefully you don't run into those, but it's don't move the person unless they're in such a dangerous position that leaving them there is more dangerous than the injury that's happening to them. But basically keeping that person still. And at that point, if you suspect a spinal injury and you don't have the tools to move that person, that's where you're going to have to look into some other kind of evacuation. That's going to take that's going to take more resources and tools than you may have to at your disposal. I just thought of another question too. Let's say somebody gets hurt and we don't have cell communication, which I never seem to have anytime I go out. When do we decide we should leave them and go get help or should we stay and hope that our, we told somebody to, we should be back at a certain time or how do we figure out what to do there? Do we leave and get help or do we wait until somebody notices we haven't returned? Yeah. And that is one of those, that is, that's a tough question to answer. The general rule of thumb is you don't want to leave your patient until some other help arrives. However, there are always circumstances in which um, case that, that might not make sense. And the case of somebody that is just getting worse and worse and worse, you could just stay with them and maybe you can't fix anything versus if you had to leave them and try to go get help, that's the best thing you can do in that situation. So my thought on this and how I would deal with it personally is um, I would want to stay with that patient for as long as I possibly could. And I wouldn't want to leave that patient unless there was a life threat that deemed if I don't leave that it's going to be more of a threat than if I stay with them. And hopefully if you're hiking in groups, you know, if you have that third person, the whole situation is going to change a little bit as far as maybe having somebody else go get help. So it's really going to come down to what's actually happening and how serious it is. And it's also going to come down to how close you are to civilization. You know, is it a case where you're going to have to spend the night in the woods unexpectedly, but you know, there's going to be traffic coming back that next day. And then you can have somebody else get help. That might be the safer bet than trying to drag somebody who's badly injured out of the woods at night. So a lot of it's going to depend on that severity of it. But generally I want to stay with that patient for as long as I possibly can. Gotcha. And another thing too I read that we didn't touch on is let's say you're hiking and you come across somebody that's injured. Don't assume it's just one person. There could be somebody else, you know, we, if you, if that person's unconscious, they may have fallen from above or whatnot. So they said, make sure, or, or just make sure it's not just one that you're treating. There could be others involved in the party with whatever the catastrophe was. Yeah. And even with our training, kind of how that goes is, you know, you see somebody laying on the ground, rolling around and groaning. So the first thing you do is look around and go, well, is it safe for me to go there? Or am I going to get hurt if I go there? And then you think about yourself, okay, I'm going to go take care of this person. Maybe I should think about putting gloves on. And the third question as you're approaching that scene before you even talk to the patient is anymore. So you're looking around going, is there anybody else around that's injured? Because a lot of times the most severely injured person isn't going to be the loudest injured person. And generally, if we hear somebody screaming at the top of their lungs, we're going to go to that person first. But it's the quiet one that oftentimes is the one that's in the most danger. So always look around. And then obviously, if your uh, patient is conscious, asking them, hey, are you alone? Is there anybody else with you? What happened? And then you kind of go into, go into it from there. Gotcha. One last question. I'll let you go. We've been very generous with your time. What do you think of first aid apps? Is that something we should have on our phone? Are they helpful at all? I think they can be um, very helpful. I think on that same topic, when you buy pre-made first aid kits, which is totally fine thing to do, just make sure that you look through and you know where things are and you can add things to them. Almost all of them come with this awesome little book inside. It has all these things to do with all these injuries that we talked about today and the very basic stuff, it's probably the heaviest part of the first aid kit. And I know a lot of people go, huh, there's this book. I'm going to throw that out. But that is basically your little, that might be all you have to go on. And when you're really freaking out in a situation, the more tools you have, the better. It's good to flip that over to the burns page and go, huh, somebody burned themselves really bad. What should I do? And then you can read right down that list. With phones nowadays, you can get apps that may have some of that very similar information. Just make sure that it works when you are not having any signal whatsoever so that (laughs) you're not relying on cell phone service. But I also like hard copies of things too. So I still like those first aid kit hard copies, but I'm not against using the phones. I just like to make sure that I know the limitations of using that phone so I can make other plans in case my phone goes away. 
Right. It could, um, it could die, fall in the water, or like you said, not have cell service. All those things. Yeah. If your phone just suddenly disappeared, can you still respond using additional tools? I like phones as backups, but I don't like them as my primary. That I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket, basically. Gotcha. And listen, Casey is an amazing photographer. And so if, if you don't mind, Casey, I'd like to also share on the show notes your Instagram and all that so people can check out. You particularly love waterfalls. And so can we share that with all, with everybody? Yeah. Gosh, what is mine? It's uh, I'll put it in the show notes so that people don't have to remember. A lot of times people are listening to podcasts while they're exercising or, or driving and whatnot. Mine is Wild NC Waterfalls. That Wild NC Waterfalls. Yeah. So anyway, so I'll put links to all that in the show notes so you can check out Casey and, and what he's up to. Any other final thoughts before we let you go? My final thoughts are just, you know, stay safe and use good judgment. And I think the one other thing that I want to mention just leaving is one of the biggest things to know is knowing your own abilities so that you don't push yourself into situations that you don't have the experience to do yet. So when you're new to something, don't jump into the most rigorous, hardest thing you can possibly do. Learn about yourself um, and what you're capable of and work yourself up to those things. And it's a lot better. We usually don't learn to swim by jumping in a river and trying to swim upstream. We usually start in a nice, easy swimming pool and work our way up. So just think of outdoors in that same way so that you have the tools you need as you get more experienced. And maybe you'll get lucky enough to find your own Casey. You never know, or your own kid. <laughs> I mean, I learned so much from you. It's, it's, you have no idea, Casey. I'm so grateful for your time today and for your friendship and all of your mentorship over the years. You're a fantastic human being. I love you to death. Thanks, Casey. We'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. Don't. Cheers. Isn't Casey great? I am so blessed to have had him on my very initial attempt to learn how to hike and learn how to backpack, and he's become a dear friend. And I'm so grateful to him for taking the time today to come and teaching us a little bit about the things that we need to think about and prepare for, particularly in advance. And I want to make sure that that, that registered about things that we should be thinking about when it comes to wilderness first aid. A couple takeaways. Number one, both Casey and I are examples of how you can completely change your life and how the outdoors has done that for us. So if you're sitting home and you're thinking, oh, you know, all those things sound great, Kit, but I can't do it. Hogwash. Literally, if I can do it, you can do it. So if you have any interest in any of the things that we've talked about on this show or the Active Travel Adventures podcast, you need to get out there and try. But do like Casey does. Baby steps. Remember that plus one. Just push yourself a little bit out of your comfort zone so that you are stretching yourself but not getting outside of your knowledge and body's bailiwick, if you know what I mean. So number one takeaway is it is possible to change your life for the better. So if that's what you want to do, get out there and do it. As far as wilderness first aid comes, I think one of the big key takeaways is the the mental preparation before you even step foot outside your house. Think about what are the possible obstacles? What are the possible things that can go wrong? What you put in your emergency pack can vary widely if you're going in the desert versus the mountains, if you're going in a rocky terrain. What are the things that can go wrong? And make sure that you have just the basic essentials to treat those. Pay attention to the weather, like Casey said. Study the map, study the terrain, study the trail. Make sure that you have done your homework so that you're going into your adventure with a good knowledge base. Another thing that I picked up, I did not realize that any animal bite, no matter how minor, is almost a guarantee for infection. So I may have maybe brushed off if, say, a chick mom or something like that did something to me. But now I learned from Casey that any animal bite, that's the end of the trip. You go get that treated because it's going to get infected. Did not know that. Infections I have had, they are not pretty. And you want to make sure that that is being treated by a professional. I like how he told us that using the fun factor as an indicator whether or not to call your trip. It makes sense, but a lot of us are stubborn and we're like, oh, we're, we're so close. Let's just make it to the summit. But... If the fun factor is saying, no, that mountain's still going to be here next time, turn around, get back to civilization, heal yourself, and then tackle that mountain another day. Another thing I thought was interesting was when he was saying with a burn, don't just stick it in a stream. I never would have thought of that. I have gotten Giardia. It's not, in fact, I was with Casey when I did that because I was hiding from him. 
the fact that I thought that I could build up an immunity, not realizing that Giardia is a parasite, but I don't think Casey knows that. But anyhow, you can learn about that in my water treatment episode, which I'll put a link in the show notes. But I would have assumed that you could just stick things in the stream to, to clean them. And, but that's not necessarily a good idea. So I always do carry when I'm backpacking, not necessarily day packing, a water treatment system of some sort. But I, it's now registered to me that I have to make sure that I am using clean water when I'm dealing with some kind of a first aid. So that was, that was a big takeaway for me. I never thought to put tablets of electrolytes in my pack, and I'm going to now add that to my emergency kit list, which again, a link in the show notes, and keep those on hand. While I have not personally experienced that problem, my father has, and so I've seen how debilitating it can be, and Casey's example as well. So we're talking less than a fraction of an ounce to prevent that from happening to you. Another main thing is you need to speak up early. Let people know if things aren't right. I'm not saying wine. Remember my, you can tell the problem one time as far as I'm concerned when we go backpacking. But if you're having a problem, don't hide it. Whether it's a blister, take the five minutes. Say, hey guys, I got to pause for a minute and I've got a little hot spot. Take care of it then. You're going to be a lot more pleasant to be around if you don't get that blister. You're going to be a lot more pleasant to be around if you hydrate yourself, etc. So taking care of these things before they become a problem is essential. You need to pay attention to your body and you need to communicate with your travel mates. I am going to put also in the show notes a link to the emergency kit with some updates that Casey has added to them and what we talked about today. I'll have links to the Knowles classes he talked about. So there's going to be a bevy of information. Very important that you do click on that show notes page. Very important that you do visit the website if you have not already, if you subscribe to the monthly newsletter, and again, that's monthly, I don't spam you. Really, really simple, first week of the month usually it comes out. It includes all the downloads from that previous month. So this will have all the things that we're talking about today in our next newsletter. So be sure that you signed up for that. You can always reach out to me at kit at activetraveladventures.com. I can add it to you then. Go to either of the websites, the Adventure Travel Show Podcast.com or ActiveTravelAdventures.com. Hit the contact, hit the newsletter links, whatever. There's lots of ways to sign up, but do so. It's got lots of free information. And like I said, I don't spam you. You can always unsubscribe at any time. I thank you again for listening. It's always a pleasure. I hope you have gotten a lot out of today's episode, that you know it and never have to use it, but it's nice to be prepared. I've got some great shows coming up in the new year. I have gone to a monthly on this podcast, so it'll be out the first Thursday of every month from now on. Next up, we're going to be learning about boondocking, which is how you can camp for free. And with all of us trying to save pennies here and there, it should be a fun episode. Until next time, this is Kit Parks. Stay safe and adventure on.